I pray that you're well on today. This is Pastor Hagwood, pastor of First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you on today. Again, uh, forgive me for being uh, a little bit late uh, in regards to our uh, late start on today. Um, normally, we'll be on at 845, of course, but we were starting at around 10 o'clock. We're trying to get close to 10 o'clock today uh, because we have a Women's Day program. Um, There's a park in praise here on our campus at First Mount Zion at 12 noon uh, on today. So uh, if you wish to come out to, uh, to, to uh, worship with us at 12 noon, please do. Um, but I wanted to make sure we got the Sunday school hour in so that we can go ahead and, and move nicely, of course, because uh, I'll be moving ex uh, with expedience with regards to getting ready for the uh, Women's Day uh, program and service that we're going to have actually on our patio on today. And um, outside, park and praise, people parking, and we'll worship outside. Um, uh, on our campus. So uh, again, 1515 Remount Road, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28208. Uh, and you can, uh, we're on the corner of West Boulevard and Remount Road. And we're actually on Remount. So with that being said, I want to just thank you for joining us. Uh, again, forgive me for the tardiness. I did say 10 o'clock uh, in a formal post, but it, it took about 10.15 to kind of get every, get me, get, first of all, get myself here on campus and then also to get everything set up appropriately. So I pray that you're well and that you're prospering even as your soul prospers. Uh, I have a, <coughs> excuse me, I have a, wanna, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, have a word of prayer at this moment uh, in time before we begin our study in our Sunday school lesson on today. So let us pray, if you don't mind, join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for this day. And thank you, God, for what you will expound to us in your word on this morning. That's right now in the name of Jesus that you meet us in this place. Allow us to experience your glory. Allow us, Lord, to see your presence and uh, experience your presence, O oh God, in this place. We thank you, Father, for this virtual space we're on uh, in order to teach and preach the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for this gospel that we call the Weangelion, the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Bless us now and keep us, Lord, in this time and in this stead, O oh Lord. Allow us to uh, soak in and saturate that which, Lord, you have for us, even now. Bless us and keep us in every way. It's in your son's name we pray, Jesus the Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So with that being said on today, uh, we're going to jump right into uh, our lesson. It's called um, Micaiah speaking truth to power. Micaiah speaking truth to power. And our prayer text is coming out of 1 Kings uh, 22, uh, chapter 22, verses 15 through 23, and also verses 26 through 28. And so our aim for change reads this way. It says, by the end of this lesson, we will identify with Micaiah's boldness in declaring the word of the Lord. Aspire to be like Micaiah when speaking the word of the Lord. And commit to those, uh, commit to tell those in power what the Lord has said. This is going to be a good lesson, y'all. Uh, the end focus goes this way. It says, Martin Fairfield, Fairchild stared at the spreadsheet. There was no way around it. His family would not be able to go on vacation this year. There, was just, there, there just was no money for it. He thought about all the fun vacations they had they had had uh, in years past and how much the kids look forward to the week of adventuring, even though they were teens now and too cool to admit it. But, but with the extra cost of college admission tests and the application fees, plus a new transmission for the car, there just wasn't the extra money. He broke the news to his family at dinner. The kids quickly offered new ways of getting the money. What if we just borrow some money from Uncle Phil? Raymond asked. What if we skip just a week or two of tithing? Denise asked. Mrs. Fairchild shook her head. Your father has made the wisest decision he can in the situation. And Martin nodded to his wife, thanking her for the support. We are not going into debt just to go to go someplace. And we, we are certainly not going to forget to give back to the Lord. I know it's not what you want to hear, 
but it's what God has provided for us this time. And the question here says, how have you followed God's guidance even when others didn't like what God had to say? And so I, I want to tell you all, just from, from the perspective of really as a pastor, um, this, is, this is the mission and calling that I have every single week, uh, every single day, uh, as I continue to minister the word of God, is the reality of sometimes bringing forth uh, bringing forth news that people don't want to hear. However, that news is paramount and germane and, and, uh, and also um, uh, important to the guidance, if you will, of people in the protection of God and also the provision of God. The, 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 the aspect of the world would say, get as much as you want, okay? The, the worldly philosophy is get as much as you want, acquire as much as you can, um, uh, enjoy the spoils of life um, and gather much, okay? And meaning tangible things. And so with that, I, I'm not being, I'm not trying to discourage anyone from um, certain things and desires that you, all, all, that you have. But when those things become so, uh, when you're so enamored by those, by those things, my question becomes, does that begin to deter you, deter your attention away from the course of God, from what God has to say, what your relationship with God is, and how um, careful you're trying to follow the wave of the Holy Spirit by way of your life and so forth? And will you allow things and stuff and so forth to block your vision toward relationship with God as well as to realize that do you really need those things in this moment in time? And, and again, it's great to have things. It's great to be able to have um, possessions, the houses and cars and, and, and even with certain material things. However, we cannot be um, um, inundated with all these things to the degree where it begins to deter and move our relationship uh, with God into a secondary position. And this is why I state this for this lesson, because truly there's sometimes bad news that we receive. But my question then becomes, how bad is that news? Is that news really so bad to the point that it's catastrophic, catastrophic to your life, to the point where, where if you didn't go to the beach or if you didn't have that car or if you didn't have this possession, that your life would be uh, would be we would be completely topsy turvy if you didn't possess those things, and we know in honesty it's not. So if it's not a necessity from the perspective of living, then it's only a luxury that you can have. And that luxury is it really necessary? Is it really needed in this moment in time? And I, and I think that we have to make sure, um, especially in 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 the United States in this country, that again we are so. Uh, we, we are, again, so inundated with materialism um, on TV. When you go to the mall, um, you know, you need to get the latest and greatest. I was at Walmart the other day, and I'm, I'm sitting there looking for some copy paper. That's all I went in there for was to get some copy paper and a few groceries. And when I went in there, a guy comes around the corner, literally searches me out and says, hey, uh, what, what, what wireless plan do you have? You know, what, what, uh, uh, what internet service do you have? Do you have Verizon or AT&T? You know, let me propose something to you. And to be honest with you, I really didn't want to hear the conversation, so I just kind of told him. He actually kind of pried in my business a little bit and said, well, how much are you paying currently? And I said, that's really none of your business how much I'm paying in regards to my service. I understand what you're doing. I understand that you've been, <laughs> you've been called to sell whatever service uh, that, you're, that, you're, um, that you're proposing and that you're promoting at this time. However, I just came in here to get some copy paper. So I'm getting my copy paper and I'm leaving because I don't have time to hear a sales pitch. And I think, again, we're so inundated with all these things that um, of, of materialism and luxury and the next best thing that what we find is even the word of God tells us that uh, you know, heaven, uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And essentially what that means is the things of God will never go away. They were always, we, we don't concentrate on the temporary, okay? Um, Paul even talks about it from the perspective of the temporal, okay? Those things are temporary. We don't, we don't put our confidence, we don't put our foundational trust in those things that are going to waste away. What, what, what did Jesus say? Um, 
not store up for yourselves treasures on earth will rust will rust and and um I can't remember the other word. It, it, I think uh, uh, we'll, we'll rust and mold basically consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven where, where, where um, moth and rust don't go through the process of uh, consuming it because those things are eternal. And so we have to come to the, uh, and it also in this, the scripture ends, wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if your treasure is in material things, then you don't have much foundation. I might, I think I may have said something there. Let me let me pause there because um, I, I, my one of my mentors uh, and thank God I, I was able to get him for my pastoral anniversary, which is in a couple of weeks um, here at First Mount Zion. Uh, the Reverend Doctor Leonzo Lynch. And one of the things he told me years ago, he said, "I want to tell you something, Sean." He said, "People got a lot of stuff, but stuff is all they got." And so when you put your trust in materialism, again, your foundation is as deep, is, is, as solid as sand. And we know sand moves. We know that you can't build anything on sand. You have to have a rock foundation in order to build a building. Upon. And so spiritually, it goes the same way. If you put your trust in those things where moth, moth and rust consume it, where thieves break in and steal, then guess what? It will break down very, very easily. This is why even in the pandemic that we're in right now, while we're not in the building per se, while we're not in the structure that we've called the church, but really people are the church, the true identity, as Dr. Freddie Haynes in Dallas, Texas uh, said during the IC3 conference this past week, he made a comment and said, the real church is being revealed right now because of the simple fact of the pandemic has us out has displaced us out of the places of worship where we have been so used to coming and so used to calling and defining it as the church that now since we couldn't come here the question becomes who has lasted through this year and some months of this pandemic to say I don't need the building to be able to say to God thank you not only for my salvation but thank you Lord for leading me and guiding me by way of your Holy Spirit through the aspects um, and realities of, the, of this life that we're dealing with, these trials and tribulations that we're going through. And so with this, there is this uh, reality that we're living out as the church even now. Me personally, I have been going back and studying the book of Acts. 7 o'clock Bible study, 7 p.m. virtually here at First Mount Zion on Facebook Live. I've been, I've been doing this study, and I'm in the early parts of the book of Acts. And one of the reasons why I believe God has led me there is because of the pandemic, is that sometimes you got to go back to where we started. What, think about this. They didn't have fancy churches. They didn't have buildings that were erected. They didn't have um, microphones and sound systems and, of course, all the other amenities that we have. They didn't have that. All they had was the gospel. They had the good news message, and they believed in Jesus Christ, that he came, that he died, that he rose again in order to give them salvation for anyone who wished to believe it. And so because of that, that becomes the trigger for the growth of the church. And what you find is you find a community that starts to grow out of that. They didn't need the edifices. They said, you know what, let's meet at your house. Let's meet down the street somewhere. It didn't matter where they met. The reality is, is that they already met God where they were. You hear that? They met God where they were. They didn't need a building to define their relationship with God. Or any uh, luxurious items, if you will, in order to say they're blessed. And I think that when we begin to speak this truth, to power in every aspect of our lives, and I'm going to get into some other areas in this lesson, that it helps to bridge the guidance upon which God leads us and some things that we may not necessarily like, that we may not necessarily um, have any leaning or leaning towards. As a matter of fact, it may look completely unattractive. And that's the reality, okay? That's the reality, and I believe this lesson is going to help bring this out for us on today. Uh, let me go, go through the aim, of the, not aim for change, but the keep in mind scripture that we have today 
It is um, 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 14. And it says, but Micaiah replied, as surely as the Lord lives, I will say only what the Lord tells me to say. That's a strong scripture. And guess what? This is the only time that this uh, prophet, Micaiah, is even mentioned in the Bible. So that's why I'm very interested in this lesson on today. And that is 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 14 from the New Living Translation. So let's get into um, our background uh, because a lot of folks don't know um, about um, this, this era of the Old Testament. And I kind of want to bring that uh, background this here in our commentary um, into uh, fruition for our, our lesson today. Again, for those that don't know, we do use uh, Precepts for Living. This is from the Urban Ministries Institute. This is our Sunday school uh, book that we use here at First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. Many African-American churches in the country, regardless of nomination, use this book. We use it as well. It's a very good resource. And we, um, we, like, we just love the teaching that's in it. Uh, because we believe it's not only relevant, uh, but it also speaks um, to our context uh, as well. But it's also filled with much biblical truth. And the editors do an awesome job in, in being able to relay that both, both historically, the historical relevance, as well as the biblical relevance, and then the application. Uh, the pragmatism, if you will, the practicality of our walk with God um, in regards to the lesson. So this is what we use. I always like to give them props. Uh, every time I uh, try to teach from this book, but this is what we use so that you know what it is, Precepts for a Living by the Urban Ministries Institute. So with that being said, um, background here from the commenta commentator says this, in 1 Kings 22, we find the kings of the northern and southern kingdoms having trouble accepting the word of God from his prophets. The king of the north, the evil Ahab, now holds the upper hand. While the king of the south, the God-fearing Jehoshaphat, has become his vassal. Okay? By treaty, Jehoshaphat is under obligation to help Ahab in any way he asks. Syria was presently at peace with Israel, and Judah, uh, and, uh, with Israel and Judah, but held a section of the land called Ramoth-Gilead. After three years of not receiving serious, serious promised tribute, Ahab wants to go to war uh, against uh, Ben-Hadad, the Syrian king. Ahab asked Jehoshaphat, will you join me in battle to recover Ramoth-Gilead? 1 Kings 22 and 4. Jehoshaphat has no alternative other than agreeing to help Ahab, but wisdom prevails and Jehoshaphat wants counsel from the Lord. Ahab agrees to listen to a God, but not the God of Abraham. Instead, he listens to the prophets of his own state religion, prophets of Baal. These men, um, these men are false prophets who tell Ahab what he wants to hear. Jehoshaphat wants to hear from a true prophet of God, not these pseudo prophets, false prophets. Ahab then calls his officials bring forth uh, Micaiah, the son of Imla, the son of Imla, the passage is the only place Micaiah is mentioned in scripture, okay? And it goes this way um, in the scripture text itself, and I'm going to read this, um, I'm going to read the entire um, printed text that we have, and then we'll go through and, and, and give explanation of uh, the text. Verse 15 of 1 Kings 22. When Micaiah arrived before the king, Ahab asked him, Micaiah, should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or should we hold back? Micaiah replied sarcastically, yes, go up and be victorious for the Lord will give the king victory. But the king replied sharply, how many times must I demand that you speak only the truth to me when you speak of the Lord. Then Micaiah told him, in a vision I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains, like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, their master has been killed. Send them home in peace. Didn't I tell you, uh, the king of Israel exclaimed, 
uh, to Jehoshaphat, uh, exclaimed, exclaimed, the king of Israel exclaimed to Jehoshaphat, he never prophesies anything but trouble for me. Then Micaiah continued, then Micaiah continued, listen to what the Lord says. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the armies of heaven around him, on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, who can entice Ahab to go into battle against Ramoth Gilead so he can be killed? There were many suggestions. And finally, a spirit approached the Lord and said, I can do it. How will you do this? The Lord asked. And the spirit replied, I will go out and inspire all of Ahab's prophets to speak lies. You will succeed, said the Lord. Go ahead and do it. So you, so you see, the, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all your prophets. For the Lord has promised your doom. Arrest him, the king of Israel ordered. Take him back to Ammon, the, the governor of the city, and to my son, Joash. Give them this order from the king. Put this man in prison and feed him nothing but bread and water until I return safely from the battle. But Micaiah replied, if you return safely, it will mean that the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added to those, uh, to those standing around, everyone mark my words. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word and may it sanctify us to the deepest roots of our heart. Again, this first uh, Kings 22, 15, through 23 and also verses 26 through 28. So with that being said, I want to read from uh, the prophecy itself, okay, um, in, in verses 15 through 18. And so we have to really break the scripture down, especially when you start getting prophetic language uh, to understand kind of what's going on. I'm going to start with the commentator writer and then we'll get into to some discussion. Once a true prophet knows once a true prophet knows the word of God, no one can prevent him from delivering the message. Okay? Micaiah did not avoid God's words even when they were unwelcome. Okay? Discouraging or negative. No matter if it cost him his life, Micaiah was committed to being true to God and his word. Micaiah sarcastically told Ahab to attack and be victorious the king knew something was wrong because Micaiah never agreed with Ahab's prophets. Ahab knew his false prophets were only saying what he wanted to hear, and he knew if the truth was to be heard, it was going to come from someone who really knew God. Ahab demanded the truth of Micaiah, though he really didn't want to hear it. Micaiah reported the opposite of what the false prophets had been saying. He told Ahab that he would be killed and his army scattered. This battle, according to Micaiah, who spoke on behalf of the, Almighty, of the Almighty God, would be a disaster. Although Ahab asked for a true word from God, when it was spoken, he pushed it aside and blamed the prophet for always being against him. Now the question here says, when you ask God in prayer for the truth about yourself, are you willing to accept his answers? And this is the question here, that the reality of our lives, we ask God. God, first of all, God cannot be played as a butler, a maid, as uh, someone who is subservient. You, we cannot play God that way, okay? Because the whole aspect of the truth of God is going to be revealed and is going to come out. Micaiah the prophet had heard from God. But ho however, all of these false prophets of Ahab were making it their point to tell him, to tell um, Ahab what he wanted to hear, even though it wasn't true. So this is where it, it, it becomes for us when we are listening and hearing um, the word of God. Okay, I, I want to bring it to our times now because I believe there's, there's much application in this lesson. What we see currently in our world, pandemic, um, racial inequities that we see, especially with police brutality uh, against um, black and brown people, minorities in this country, unjustly, unjustly, 
uh, unveiled. What we find is, is that at some juncture, playtime is over. Okay? At some place and point, God's truth is going to be explained in a way that's going to be very poignant, very direct, to the point that you can't deny it. Okay? Most of the prophets of God in the Bible, they did not try to skirt over the word. They did not try to massage it with vernacular and language that was, was scholarly and so forth in order to appease the people. No, whatever God said, they communicated it. Even, it, even if it was unwelcome, even if it was negative, they would make it a point to say it because it was God's word coming through them in order to be communicated out to the folks that needed to hear it. And my question becomes, is when was the last time that you heard from God, heard from God, and you heard the truth from God, whether it was from the preach word, whether it was from your prayer time and meditation time with God, maybe, and I also believe this, that God works for the people to get communication to you because he knows how you respond because he created you. So because of the way that you were created, God knows how you respond. So when you begin to see and hear particular things that you know are the truth, and you know they are tied to God, tied to God, and tied to, uh, tied to Christ, the reality becomes how are you adhering to these things, or are you adhering to them at all? Much of what we're seeing in the world right now, and this is where a lot, I have a lot of issue, you know, personally right now, especially with a lot of the doctoral studies that I'm doing right now, um, because I really be believe God is bringing me back, not only to the essence of the church, but also to the essence of my own Afrocentric um, Afro nature. So my Afrocentricity, me being an African American, me being a black man, okay, um, how does that relate from the perspective of my only relationship with God, but also the um, congruency or synonymous um, attributes of what I can see of what has been in the Bible, what's in the Bible, to my experience, as well as to Christ's life and my experience. And, and what I, I have oftentimes looked at, and I still study even now, is the essence of servant leadership and how it projects, how it projects from the perspective of those who are oppressed, okay? And I know this sounds like definitely a James Cone theology from that perspective, um, and it, it really is. It really deals with, I deal with a lot of theologians from reading and so forth, um, kind of a J.D. Otis Roberts as well. So when you start to literally look at this, there are connection pieces where you can't help but to exclaim the truth and expound upon it based off the congruency that you see from the word of God. The example that we're looking at in the lesson here is that Micaiah, he was like, I don't care who you are, Ahab. I don't care who you are. I really don't care. At the end of the day, God has given me a word. That word has got to be communicated to you. And the question is, how are you going to respond to that word, word once it goes forward? Because the question for, for, for uh, really for Ahab is this. Will he believe puppets, vassals, if you will, <laughs> vassal uh, prophets that only are there to appease him? And he knows this. He chose them. He handpicked them. So he knows that, but he listens to them in order to only hear praise and uh, affirmation to all the wrongdoing he's doing. Sounds familiar. How many politicians have done that? Hmm. How many preachers have done it? How many leaders in general have done that? Well, you surround yourself with individuals to make them think like you, to make them think like you, only to hear their advice, which is no advice at all, and really is really, really lies or, or, or things to appease you to appease you to say that you're doing a good job or that you know, you're the greatest president that we've ever had or things of that nature. And it's only 
gas you up, but it's not helping anybody, and it sure is not helping, helping you because you're living a lie and you're living a reality living a reality of a lie, thinking it's the truth because you've surrounded people around you because you want to always think that you're always right. That is a Messiah complex. It really is. And unfortunately, this is why I am a strong proponent of servant leadership in every, in every aspect. Not only because it works, but it's truth. It's real. It's speaking truth to power. That's the lesson title today. Speaking truth to power. Because when you speak truth, that's where power comes from. And folks who are laying in either the bed or cesspool of lies, calling them the truth, okay? Uh, they, they are deceiving themselves in many aspects. It's like Paul said in Romans chapter 1, and I invite you to read it on your own in your own devotion time. Um, Romans chapter 1, Paul says this. And I, I don't have my Bible right in front of me, but I'm going to try to uh, paraphrase the scripture as best as I can. Paul says that they, that he said that man would worship, want to worship the creation rather than the creator. Okay? Not only would he rather do that, but also he would exchange the truth of God for a lie. Wow. To exchange the truth of God for a lie. Because the truth of God must have a response to it that affirms God's message to the right order of living. And if we don't listen to that, then what we're basically doing is believing a lie. This is what Paul was trying to uh, convey in that first chapter of Romans. Is that he said they would rather exchange the truth of God for a lie, even when they know the truth, but they don't wish to hear the truth. They want to hear a version of the truth that's not the truth at all and live through that. Live through the facade and the falsehood of, of that lie. And they're calling it the truth when they know it's not. To paint a picture. Uh, um, to paint a picture uh, of, of, of success over a backdrop of instability. Something to really think about, okay, uh, from that perspective. And so when this comes out, and even the question that's addressed here, when you ask God in prayer for the truth about yourself, are you willing to accept the answers? This is what we have to deal with. Because when you really think about and look at yourself, there's some stuff that God has already told you about you that you know is not right. You, when I say not right, meaning not that God isn't right about it. However, you know the truth about it, but you know you've been doing it and know it's been wrong. But you've been living that lie out and calling it and, and basically calling it true. And this is why it's so important for God to steer us, to reproof us, and to correct us in every aspect of our lives to bring us in due order and due bounds, not only with him, but with humanity and, and how we operate in the world. No man is perfect. God already knows that. The question is, will you receive when you receive to perceive bad news as good news when it comes from God. Because all news that comes from God is actually good news. Even when it's unwelcome. Even when it's negative. It's still the truth. And because it's the truth, it's going to set you free. It's going to set all of us. It's, it's all of us free in our spiritual walk to not have spiritual change and bondage uh, on our lives. And that's why it's so important that we really be real with ourselves from that perspective. Ahab in this instance didn't want to be real. My question is, look at our world today. How many police officers, unfortunately, rogue police officers don't want to be real about what they're doing? Why don't they want to be real in regards to what's really happening? Okay? Why is it that judges are hiding, lawyers are hiding information, 
video cam footage, video cam footage, and a host of other things. Why a judge says, no, we, we don't need to release that video. When there's a family over here saying, how, how can you not release this when it's evident through an autopsy that our loved one was shot in the back of the head? Wow. And so this is where, again, we see the inconsistency of truth because someone wants to hide the truth because of the negativity that is tied to it based off them. But other people need to see it and understand that truth because that truth needs to be exposed for what it is, for what it is in order to speak through, speak to and speak through the injustices that are continuing to happen in our world. And yes, I'm speaking about the Elizabeth City, North Carolina situation that's currently going on. Um, that a judge comes back and says, um, no, we're not releasing anything in 30 days. We're not releasing a video cam uh, until 30 days later. Now, okay, if you're going to do that now and the family's sitting here waiting, my question then becomes how, because of that, you waiting, at, say in 30 days, that means that now what you're trying to do is figure out a cover-up if you will, to put your case together to be able to say, okay, how, what, what, how can we make this look like it was legitimate? Okay, how can we make this look like um, it was probable cause? N now you got thirty days to put the story together before you release a video cam that everybody needs to see, and the laws were passed for the vid those video cams. So there was transparency amongst the police department. Well, there's no transparency if you don't release the video. Speaking truth to power. The truth is in the video, not in what you say. So because of that, when, when, when folks begin to neglect or become negligent in regards to releasing the truth, then the question becomes, well, if, you're not, if you don't want to let us to see the truth, what are you hiding? Brings that question. Not making anything accusatory toward anyone. But if we're trying to get to the truth of the matter, then everything needs to be put on the table as far as transparency is concerned so that everyone can see it. And this is one of the very reasons why I'm really, truly exploring relation, relationship of, um, a relationship of God, our relationship with God from the perspective of not only speaking truth to power, but from the maneuvering, if you will, maneuvering, if you will, of how, unfortunately, certain groups will not speak out against these very injustices that we see, but also are the very same ones to tell us that, um, really, is there anything really going on and, and still um, send money to my ministry and things of that nature. But, no, but you're not advocating for justice. And we serve a God who is a God of the oppressed. But in your pulpit, you won't speak out on it. Which is amazing again to me. If we are truly on the side of God, not God being on our side, because when we say that, say that sometimes, that sounds like that bellhop made uh, butler syndrome of, of Jesus, that we want to make him uh, our servant and we tell Jesus what to do. No. No, no, no. We need to be on the side of God. Not God being on our side. Because if our side is not on God's side, then it's on, it's on the enemy's side. And, God, and God's not going to correspond with that mess. He's not. So let's keep this in mind. Okay? Um, it's a challenging word, challenging scripture. But I think that we need to focus in and hone in on it because of the simple fact that it really, when we talk about God's truth, then let's talk about God's truth, not our own truth. Because our righteousness, as Isaiah 64 and 6 has told us, is as a filthy rags. Our righteousness means nothing. We don't have righteousness. We have to attain God's righteousness and be seeking that. Hmm. There's no one righteous. No, not one. I think that's what Paul said. We're not righteous. We have to seek God's righteousness. Hmm. Let me go a little further, y'all. 
verses 19 through 23. Then Micaiah continued, listen to what the Lord says. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the armies of heaven around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, and the Lord said, who can entice Ahab to go into battle against Ramoth Gilead so he can be killed? There were many suggestions. And finally, the spirit approached the Lord and said, I can do it. How will you do this? The Lord asked. And the spirit replied, I will go out and inspire all of Ahab's prophets to speak lies. You will succeed, said the Lord. Go ahead and do it. Verse 23. So you see, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of all your prophets. For the Lord has pronounced your doom. Oh, Ahab didn't want to hear that. Listen to this. The prophet spoke about vision. Okay. Micaiah saw the Lord sitting on his throne surrounded by a host of angelic beings. These angelic beings were not there to advise God. Instead, they served as witnesses of God's uh, omniscience and omni uh, omnipotence. The Lord asked how he can persuade Ahab to fight Ramoth Gilead. One spirit came forth with a plan to lie to the king through his prophets. Then Yahweh gave him permission to go and do so. Ahab sought to suppress divine authority and truth. God in his uh, omniscience affected his sovereign, his sovereign will by allowing this lying spirit to feed the king's own destructive ego through the untruths of his prophets. God gave Ahab what he wanted, his own wish instead of God's truth. I love, I love how he said that. God gave Ahab what he wanted, his own wish instead of God's truth. And it led to Ahab's death. Our God is the God of those with pure hearts, as well as those with um, perverse hearts. God can and will use any means necessary to carry out the sovereign will. That's John 12 and 40, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 11, and Exodus 14, verses 4 and 8. And I know some are bothered by the aspect of well, you know, God allowed a lying spirit, okay, to um, persuade Ahab, okay? Um, you know, God is not an author of confusion. He's not an author of chaos and confusion. So why would God allow that, okay? Um, theologically, I, 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 deal, I deal with this question, and I, I always have to go back to the New Testament because I think Paul does the best, he gives the best explanation uh, forward. It's in, it's in Romans chapter 1 as a matter of fact. And when it, it when the scripture says that, um, that they would rather worship the creation rather than the creator, that um, they would rather exchange the truth of God for a lie. And then it says after that, it says that God then gave them over to a reprobate mind. Okay. Now, this is where people say, well, what, God, why would God give them over to something that's against him? Okay. We, us, we must understand that God allows us to have, have free will, okay? Um, I'm, a, I, I'm just of the belief theologically that God already knows what's going to happen. He already knows. God already knows what's going to happen because he knows the end from the beginning, period. He knows the end from the beginning. He already knows what's going to happen. However, he still gives us free will. And the question then becomes, well, how can he give us free will when he already knows what's going to happen? Well, that's the thing, is that regardless of the choice we make, God already knows that choice that we're going to make. But he still gives us free will to choose. And that's, and that's, the, that's what messes people up because that speaks of the divinity of God. That God is truly omnis uh, omniscient, all, he's all-seeing, and he's also all-powerful, Okay? So because of those attributes, it's very hard to put God in a descriptive box because it flows outside of the box very easily out of the limitations of what we think. So the question becomes, well, if, he gave, if God already knows what's going to happen, 
then how do we have free will to make a choice? Well, look at where the choices that we've made in our lives. We had a choice, didn't we? We had a choice whether we wanted to do right or wrong, to, 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 to go God's way or go, go Satan's way. We had a choice. So when we chose what we chose, God already knew that before. He already knew what was going to be chosen. He knew that. So either way that you choose, God already knows what you're going to choose. So this is the scope of the divinity of God. And so with that, this is why when, when uh, the commentator writer says that God gave Ahab what he wanted, his own wish, instead of God's truth. But the question then comes out of that, could Ahab have made another choice? And I say yes. He could have made another choice, but he didn't. So God can't give you over to a reprobate mind, a reprobate mind, unless you yourself are willing to choose to be reprobate. If you choose to sing in this God, and that's where your heart is, that's where, where, that's where your being is, then God opens that door and says, you made your choice. So since you've made your choice, I have no other choice but to allow you to do it. It's not that I want to, but because you're choosing to, once you've made that choice, it, 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 it happens. It is what it is. A scripture was trying to come to my mind, and it's not coming to, to me right now. Um, And the text goes, I think, um, and as such as a man thinketh, so is he. Okay? So if you're already in that mindset, heart set of doing evil, God knows what you're already going to do. If you're, your heart is already set to it, God has already opened that door and said, okay, you have that choice. Are you going to choose me or are you going to choose that, that evil thing and go against me? The choice is still ours at the end of the day. And I think that's something that we have to really think about from that perspective. Because what people want to say is that, well, God put me in this situation. Did God put you in that situation? Or were the things that you wanted, the wishes that you wanted instead of God's truth, the wishes that you wanted is what you sought after. But you weren't seeking out the God's truth. And since you weren't seeking out his truth, God would have gave you over to his truth if you would have chosen it. But since you didn't choose it, and you wanted what you want, you wanted what you desired that wasn't of God, God said, okay. I'll give you over to it. God wants us to make decisions for ourselves that align with his that align with what he wants for us. He, that's what he wants. But he still gives us that synergistic, that synergistic reality. That's a theological word. Uh, where, where literally there is a synergy of choice that we still can make in regards to doing God's will or having our own wishes, if you will. Something to think about. Verses 26 to 28. Arrest him, the king of Israel ordered. Take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to my son Joash. Give them this order from the king. Put this man in prison and feed him nothing but bread and water until I return safely from the battle. <laughs> Verse 28. But Micaiah replied, if you return safely, it will mean that the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added to those st standing around, everyone mark my words. And when Ahab went to battle, Ahab died. Because the prophecy said so. He still had a choice whether or not he would go into battle, meaning Ahab. He still had a choice. Micaiah gave the prophecy. But Ahab had his own wishes. 
and did not want to lean to God's truth. It's amazing to me as we apply ourselves in this world right now, okay? How so many people are leaning themselves away from the voice of God. And when they see atrocities, injustices, murder by the police, when they see these things and see them for what they are and know what they are, but still turn their head away from it, it makes me wonder, really makes me wonder heavily, oh man, heavily. Do you not want to yield to God's truth at all? Or do you just want to live life thinking that we can just put, make political correctness out of something that is so sinister, so evil? We battle not against flesh and blood, blood but against principalities and powers in high places. We must understand, preachers, understand this. We must preach and teach the gospel truth, regardless of how it might be unwelcome, how it may temporarily hurt someone, how it may be negative or sound negative, even though it's really positive, because God's word is there to protect us, to be our shield and buckler, God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path that leads us into the ways of righteousness. And when we don't adhere to that truth and when we don't adhere to that power, what we're saying is, is that we don't need God. We don't need God's truth. That God has no control over the world, over the earth, over the heavens. He has no control over us. So why should we even listen to what God has to say? If Derek Chauvin would have heard the voice of God and heard the justice and saw that what he was doing to George Floyd was not right. And so well, how could he hear the voice of God? Well, you had individuals that were right there videoing and around him and saying, you're killing the man. You're murdering him. He can't breathe. Don't you see you're hurting him? But they refused to listen. Oh, excuse me, he refused to listen. Because somewhere in the back of his mind, maybe because of all the injustices that he had done in the past based off his uh, record as a police officer, that he felt the rogue behavior that he had done in the past was justified, so he would do it again against George, George Floyd, not no that it would land him right in prison and if he would only had listened to the voice of God because God's voice doesn't necessarily have to come through the clouds it comes through other people as well with all those individuals standing there saying that you're killing this man he did not, he was looking at him he heard them and he did not he did not pull back he did not relent he did not say you know what this is not right. Let's get off his back. Let's get off his neck. No, let's just get him in the car and arrest him. Over what? Did he kill a man? Did he rob the cup food store? No. He only tried to pass a $20 bill that was fake and probably didn't know that it was fake. And now he's gone. Think about this when we say speak truth to power. In every church that is open in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, and I don't care what race it is, okay? Whether it's African American, Caucasian, Asian, Hispanic, whatever, Indian, it doesn't matter. Korean, Vietnamese, doesn't matter. When God's truth goes forward, it should make us Pause 
and say, Lord, show me what is right and allow me to execute and walk in that righteousness. If we weren't, when we're not doing that, we're only trying to satisfy our own wishes rather than trying to live out God's truth. Hmm. I will say this, I am very ashamed uh, of, of the process, judicial process and law enforcement, especially in North Carolina with this Andrew Brown um, situation in Elizabeth City. You mean to tell me to satisfy and to appease potentially rogue police officers that essentially executed a man shot him several times and you will not release the transparency video video cams and say you got to wait 30 days that smells like a cover-up that smells like someone wanting to satisfy their own wishes rather than executing god's truth something to think about I'm very heavy and very passionate about speaking truth to power. Uh, the aspect of what we oftentimes phrase as uh, black liberation theology. Um, there are many scholars that are around it. Um, I honestly believe that uh, my walk with Christ, uh, me being a pastor, is going to be centered, being really an African, being an African American pastor, and that really centers on that. I have a very unique background in my theological education. Um, uh, I was educated in a very evangelical seminary, um, very evangelical seminary. And I actually thank God for that experience. Um, even when uh, I had a colleagues ask me, well, why, why didn't you go to another seminary that maybe was more favorable to our cause as African Americans? Why did you go to Gordon Conwell uh, specifically. And I told them that's where I was led. Um, and I understand where they're coming from, from that perspective. Um, however, I said God led me in that place and I'm starting to understand more of the reason why uh, that he did uh, during that time. And now um, I'm definitely at a, uh, my doctoral program is at a, at a more um, um, modernist, I guess, uh, seminary, if you will, um, and much more sensitive to the aspect of racial injustice um, uh, than, than I think than where I went to. Um, biblically, I thank God for what they taught me at Gordon Conwell. Uh, it was just a matter of some of the theology that I had, and especially the practicality of that theology where I had issue and had question. Uh, but I believe this is part of the challenge uh, for any preacher uh, that again, when we are talking about God's truth, what are we talking about? Are we talking about our own wishes? Or are we talking about truly God's truth? And what that truth needs to look like? And what that truth needs to be spoken about? To my white brothers and sisters um, uh, in, in ministry, uh, and I have many uh, Caucasian friends in ministry, um, I, I just challenge many of you who will not speak out uh, against racial injustice, who will not speak out against um, speaking truth to power. If you are ashamed of it or if you feel that you know, I could be fired because of it, maybe that's not the congregation you need to be shepherding. Because when you speak God's truth, it's going to hurt people but not hurt people to the point of death. It's going to hurt them to put the place of maybe killing off some things that God never wanted or intended to be planted there and to resurrect them to a new aspect and new relationship of life within the body of Christ. Christ is not a bellhop. We have to be on God's side, not God being on our side. He's always been on our side. But the question is, have we been on his? If we're not preaching and teaching 
about the injustices that are going on in our world and what we're seeing, we are missing the mark and missing a very highly prized opportunity to be able to show the reality of Jesus, not only the, the uh, meek and mild Jesus, not only the, the Jesus that healed the sick and raised the dead and fed 5,000 on the side of a hill with two fish and five loaves of bread. That's great and that's real. But we should also teach about the God of the oppressed, the Christ who was a carpenter from the ghettos of Nazareth teaching along the Sea of Galilee about a kingdom of God that was for all people and also for those who are oppressed, who are suppressed, and who continue to experience injustices in our nation and in our world. This is something to think about, and I want us all to be challenged by it as pastors and preachers, because if we're not speaking that gospel, and if we're not speaking that truth they were only trying to satisfy our own wishes or maybe even the wishes of the appeasement of others rather than the truth of God which will set us free God's blessings to you on today I pray that you enjoyed this lesson uh, I'm going to pray at this time and uh, dismiss and at 12 noon we're going to have uh, our parking praise here at First Mount Zion for our Women's Day program. Let us pray. Most eternal all wise God and Father, thank you Lord for this day. <sighs> Speak the truth to power. Thank you Lord. Because your truth, when it's spoken, oh Lord, it has to be heard. But it also has to be maneuvered and become kinetic in order that we are positioning ourselves to do Form the work of the kingdom of God by way of your righteousness. I ask right now, Father, that you bless us, O oh Lord, as we dismiss this place, not for your presence, virtual space. Give us what we need on the journey of life. We'll be careful to give your name, praise, honor, and glory. We love you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray, Jesus the Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I am Pastor Hagwood, Reverend Eshawn Hagwood, Master of Divinity. I am the senior pastor of First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you. Take care. Be blessed. Love you in the Lord. And there's nothing that you can do about it. Take care and be blessed. And we will see you at a future time if it's the will of God. God's blessings to you. Take care and be blessed.